This is the OGM Weekly Call, Open Global Mind, uh, on Thursday, April 25th, 2024, 425 um, It is rainy in Portland uh, after a couple of really nice days of weather. Very happy to be out of winter, more or less. Uh, Judy's in Minneapolis and reports that it's warmer than here. It's like 65 today in Minneapolis, so that's good. Um, and today we have a check-in call uh, because we just had two calls about Gaza and trauma and all sorts of things like that. And as I said in the invite uh, earlier, I would love it if a piece of anyone's check-in who was moved to do so was some reflection on the trauma conversations and um, including what resonated for you, uh, what you discovered or realized or whatever, or if you'd like us to go back into the topic or anything like that. Um, and uh, Mark, it's lovely to see you. We haven't seen you for a little bit. I uh, thank you for being here. You're muted. Yeah. Well, there's been some trauma. I'm sorry to hear that and happy to see your face and hear your voice. Well, I, I just had my gallbladder removed yesterday. Oh, and yesterday? Yesterday, yes. Great You're home cost. already? Um, yeah. Um, uh, endoscopy. Um, so four incisions and uh, uh, expanding the uh, abdomen with uh, CO2, apparently. They blow you up like a balloon so they can look around. They can look around. And uh, uh, I uh, read um, some of the matter most about the, uh, about the trauma discussions. Um, Certainly, huh. um, <laughs> I've had my share um, and, uh, you know, didn't realize when I was growing up that uh, my parents were not always uh, uh, presenting the best emotional um, foundation, but uh, um, didn't realize that uh, until, what, 50 something years later. And uh, it has consequences. It's really kind of a, um, a shocking kind of thing. But I'm here. Um, I'm going to mostly listen. I'm going to turn off my uh, uh, video and uh, uh, munch uh, a little breakfast. It's odd. They say I can go back to a normal diet. Um, but I had a walnut size um, uh, gallstone that only really felt anything Thursday night and then again Sunday night it's like what doesn't make any sense but um uh yeah could be uh a reason why I wasn't feeling that great for you know, a couple of weeks and kind of focusing on work at the internet archive uh which is going well um and I'm taking a D web for creators course that I got a uh Full scholarship from the Filecoin Foundation for the distributed web. So um, that's interesting and seeing how other people, especially artists, are kind of poking around uh, the distributed web. And um, it's good to see everybody here. I know everybody here. Um, and uh, again, I read um, the triple threats uh, for the last two meetings. Uh, so Hi. Thank you. And uh, thank you. Thanks, Mark. Um, our usual check-in protocol is I will step aside, so I won't direct any traffic until everybody's done checking in, unless new people join the the, the, the call, in which case I might just use the chat. Uh, we have gone on full silent chat during check-in, uh, so please don't. If you're, if you're going to share links or whatever else, which is a great thing, we absolutely adore just keep those links in a separate notepad or someplace for yourself until we've finished with the check-in round. And then we can pour them all in. But we would like the quality of attention to uh, be that of actually sitting and paying attention to each other during check-in. Pauses are not only not a bad thing, they're a good thing. So don't feel like you've got to power in uh, and check-in. We, we sort of add extra pauses to the check-in round to make up for our often lack of pauses in the topic rounds where we kind of still race through topics and keep going. Um, and then um, 
don't feel like you need to reply to anybody. And uh, um, I think I'm forgetting a couple of a couple of our ground rules for for check ins, but that's about it. So with that, I'm going to um, mute myself and put this on auto autopilot. Well, since you asked for reflections on trauma and how that ties in, I was thinking about the, the really small kind of traumatic things. So I was very lucky in my childhood. I always felt safe with my parents. I always felt like I could speak up from the time that I could speak. We were in, we had a strange kind of family. If we were all sitting in the car and my parents were having a discussion, I could interject I could contradict, I could point out where something they said wasn't consistent. That being said, my earliest memory was being rebellious in the sense that they were trying to take a picture of me. I was about two and a half and it was hot. We were on the beach and for whatever reason, I, we were going in and my parents decided now's the time to take pictures. And I remember very well knowing that I was going to cry through these pictures and not let them get a shot. But the reason I bring that up <laughs> is because at one point, well, I was interested in learning about past lives, but that's another story. But when I was regressed and this memory was brought up, it was pointed out that I came in with this rebellious nature. And the reason I bring it up now is because as I talk to different people on Facebook, and see their anger coming out, it dawned on me that there are a lot of people that I, so I think it's fairly common that when children are young, they have this moment where they say, when I grow up, I'm not going to do that. I think that's like a fairly common thing. And it feels like when I'm talking to different people, it's almost like they're channeling this kind of repressed feeling that they've had for whatever force they've been fighting and it just comes out. I mean, most of you know, I try to be very civil. I've been called a genocidal Nazi POS <laughs> where I've actually had MAGA people defending me. <laughs> so this was not, this was not from a Democrat or a Republican. I mean, there's just so much rage um, coming from peacekeepers. So I just wanted to bring that out because, you know, we're talking about the big trauma and that's one thing, but I think it's the subtle trauma that makes us react in ways that we're not even aware of. So that's my, that's my check-in. Oh, and one more thing. I'm really upset that Harvey Weinstein's conviction got overturned on appeal. And I just hope we start investing. I mean, I don't know how many of you know, but two of the judges recused themselves and got replaced by two more who were among the two that voted to turn it over only because they said some of the witnesses were prejudicial because they weren't in the original argument. And to get dismissed with that kind of a technicality, that's just outrageous. Now I'm done. Well, I can build a bit on that. I was uh, originally going to do another check-in. I'll, I'll do that as an appendage at the end uh, because I was quite moved uh, 
Stacy, by the way you explained uh, that personal trauma and um, the I missed last week's trauma discussion, but I was uh, very involved uh, emotionally with the first one. And there is a trauma at the moment in the world, which is uh, making me lose some of my uh, inbred uh, optimism or idealism or active hope. Uh, and it seems to be uh, becoming more and more a situation of anger and fear and the site you say see rage. Um, there's something going on in the in the world uh, where there's a kind of confusion about what our priorities or what our purposes or uh, what our ideals or what our values are. And it's like a, a mental sickness. I know in the past year or so, we've discussed uh, concepts like wetigo, uh, a mental virus. And I always was able to hold that at arm's length and look at it as something to be uh, analyzed or to, to see if there were patterns in it or something more conceptual. And in the last couple of weeks, it's become for me very much personal. And just to go into one example, uh, uh, anti-Semitism and the, the confusion of Israelis with Jewish people or Hamas with Palestinians and actually uh, both Jewish people and Palestinians are all Semitic. So it's it's a strange cancer's growth on the idea of uh, anti-Semitism to have some countries, for example, in, in Europe and country I live in the Netherlands, becoming more and more anti-Islamic and the the result of what's going on in Gaza, making people not so much anti-Israel, but anti-Jewish people. And looking at it in the way that I normally look at things is, what can you do about it? How can you help uh, the situation in whatever way? And uh, that's a question I have and maybe other people here have the same question or have answers to it. What I was originally going to talk about are uh, spaces because I'm uh, very much uh, involved with the idea of uh, spaces for healing, spaces for good conversation, spaces for uh, uh, building solutions, both physical co-present spaces and online spaces. And uh, when I talk about online spaces, I often uh, use this example of the Thursday OGM call as a very positive space. But uh, the question that keeps coming back because of that international and personal trauma I started talking about is can something be done to create healing spaces for students in America or for uh, woke people or for extremist far right people or for Israelis who don't support the governments or for Palestinians who don't support Hamas to clear up some of the confusion in the world. Well, I went on a long time, but that's my check-in for today.
Yeah, I, I mean, as as I mentioned before, my, my daughter, you know, married uh, a boy coming uh, from Tel Aviv, um, and uh, he's in the you know, jewelry business, and uh, um, so she converted you know, to Judaism, and uh, um, and that that kind of conversion um is typically conservative Jewish, right? I mean, so she's kosher and all those things. And, and she's really, um, I mean, she has like four daughters now, right? I mean, we just got the, she has like a two months, two years, four years, six years, and she's done. But uh, no, it's a, it's a, um, she's, she, so she's very uh, um immersed you know in the uh in the synagogue in the jewish community center and so on and it's a beautiful community you know um because the 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 they're so focused on their children and everything is about you know the kids and so her circle of friends and so on are very close and it, it's really uh uh it's really uh uh, a wonderful you know experience you know to see her with her children um and so we did have you know a little hard time uh, uh, in the beginning with uh, w where we were gauging you know how uh, uh, our relationships and um and so we had like for a, a time two years time out you know um but now we we you know we we are really embracing each other and talking and and also with uh, with her son, uh, I'm, I I, st I started to really develop you know uh, father son in law kind of relationship. So it's all really good. Um, this was you know, a heartbreaking visit. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm gonna make it through this year, but you know we we, we strenuously avoided you know, any kind of conversation about you know, all this conflict uh, until you now the last two days. Um, and so my daughter asking that, I mean, how how do I explain this to my children? She goes, I have no idea how to talk about this. Yeah. And so my my thinking was stay in the middle. I mean, talk about what's good about you know, the, the Jewish faith, you know, about love and tenderness and care and so on and all this uh, the, what what you experience there. But that didn't satisfy, you know, didn't satisfy her. So then we got into a more, you know, open discussion. And um, she's basically embedded in an information world that puts up a completely different reality, right? I mean, Al Jazeera is the enemy, the United Nations lies, uh, all the statistics coming out of Gaza are just garbage, you know, they are... Uh, so, so I just kept asking a few questions that sort of tumbled her assumptions, but you could see that she that the the, uh, the uh, cognitive dissonance she was experiencing when I asked the question, she started to scream. Yeah, uh, it was painful for her to to hear. I mean, just simply saying, "Do you know how many Palestinians live in in Israel?" She had no idea. I said, "You know, there are five plus million." Palestinians and seven plus million Israelis. I mean, how, how do you sort this out, right? I mean, you can't just negate them. Um, yeah. And so, so there is no solution. I mean, it's just simply the world is outraged because this is just a no solution uh, conflict that can lead only to further chaos and more harm and, and pain. So then you realize that her entire friend circle is also you know, denying any kind of conflicting information. So there's a siege mentality in there. You know? So they, they are circling the wagons. This is us, you know, the world needs <coughs> us. It's about anti-Semitism again. It's hating the Jewish people. There's a complete denial uh, about the, the war uh, uh, reality of you know, how Palestinians are being treated. Um, and so it's my daughter actually calling that just one thing. Sweet. Sweet, I have to call you back, okay? I'm just in the in the call.
Yeah, sorry. So, so my son, uh, you know, who who is also you know, wide awake, um, um, and 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 uh, you know, uh, very interested in in a, in a lot of range things. He's saying that I'm trying to hold multiple realities in my head, multiple truths, right? And it's getting more and more complicated to do that uh, because they, they, these contradictions are just uh, are just uh, are crazy, you know, painful. So, so that's that's where that is, and this is what cost me, you know, yesterday to go to uh, have this conversation with my AI. Um, now saying so so what is truly you know the this transitional message from the old testament to the new testament when you bring it right down to the core right it was a recognition that if you are more successful than others you you still have to take the others with you at some you know somehow um, you have to do good. You have to you you have to have empathy in the way you interact in the world, and if you don't, then at some point in time it comes back to bite you. It circles. Yeah. Um, and and so I posted this thing. It was the conversation actually went into a different place than I had intended. The AI sort of uh, routed that into a different direction, but I thought. It was it was really powerful because you know, to me New Testament thinking really is um, a meta level thinking. You know? it, it really is how do you as a society create something that that has uh, sustainability to, uh, embedded in it? You know that that maintains wholeness. And so um, I think that's really the challenge of our of our time. There is no technical solution. Uh, there is no. Uh, uh, you know, let's invent something different here. There really is what what we really need is a reformation uh, uh, of our minds. You know, to to uh, put center place because you can't when you when you can trust others to have uh, the same empathic mindset you know, that that governs your decision making, then everything just works. Right? because you're you're starting to work towards the, towards the same goals you there's very little coordination required it just happens but we don't have that you know we we, we have uh, a lot of selfishness and, and and greed in our in our interactions and it's just killing us uh, so so that was yeah but what I came back with is um we have, as families we just have to step back from all that you now and we, we just have to accept that no matter what happens here, we love each other. You know, we are uh, we are we are one. You know, and all these things that are happening, we just need to we need to just weather that storm and and see where where it takes us, but swing with it. Uh, so love it really is the only um, emotion that can cut you through that. So anyway, long story. Klaus, thanks so much for sharing that. Uh, I've had some alternate realities within my family, and it it's really hard. And it's in, in the worst part is is you don't really know what's going on inside the brains of your brother or your father, or, and 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 you don't know all the impacts of the tens of thousands of hours of propaganda that they've been hearing. It's it's uh, and and. You don't know how isolated they might be. I mean, you try to bring new facts to the table, but um, either they're rejected or there isn't the curiosity that you think should be there to hear a different story. Um, I hope that in future sessions of this group, we will uh, move, you know, we've we've talked trauma, now let's talk truth and maybe talk about the the, the relationship between the two. Um, it, it was kind of coincidental, but uh, a week after our second trauma call, I went to church on Sunday. Um, I'm kind of a once or twice a month person, but I also went this Sunday because there was a special guest speaker at the adult forum, which is between our two church services. 
and the woman's name was um let me just check it it was uh the the, the name of the book was motor home prophecies and um her name her last name was sheffield sheffield she grew up in this very strange environment it was carrie sheffield her father was a uh, very conservative Mormon uh, member of one of these very strange cults that have branched off. And he, they had eight kids and he was convinced he was the next prophet. Uh, he, and he, you know, he was, a, uh, he was eventually kicked out of the church because he was basically claiming to have, you know, direct link to, to God but they would travel around trying to recruit people to be Mormons. And it took her a while just to realize all the trauma that she was being exposed to and his, his rage and, you know, the, the con total control he was trying to have over the lives of his kids and his wife. And, and they would travel around the country in a, in a motor home and just set up shop and do these ad hoc uh, sermons on you know the right way to think to get to God, and and it was fascinating to hear how she tried to work through the trauma and mostly by distraction, you know, getting subsumed into a uh, a, a, a career, uh, trying to embrace someone so tightly that in a relationship that she could just ignore everything else and all of her memories. Um, she she kind of worked things out, but it was it was fascinating just to see how uh, much damage could be done over that fifteen years of her childhood, and how alien she seemed to the real world. She she uh, managed to get into Brigham Young University, even though she was homeschooled and uh, and not a very not very good teachers. Um, and and she sort of worked things as I say worked things out, but she had to just discover a whole new world, and she had to listen to the people telling her how reality might actually be, uh, in contrast to what her father had been telling her. Um, so I, I I do hope that we will look at 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 truth, and 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 that is the other theme of my check in this week. Um at least three different episodes this week where I just held my head and said, what the hell? Um, you know, we've got Marjorie Taylor Greene trying to get funding for space lasers to defend the, the border with Mexico. We've got Harvey Weinstein um, winning his lawsuit because for some reason the courts can't consider previous behavior when deciding whether somebody is likely to do bad things. That's how Jeffrey Epstein managed to get a rather light sentence the first time. They, they by just focusing on one or two incidents, they, and, and not discussing all the other terrible things. And, and Trump might get off because they weren't able to drag in all the other cases. I mean, the, the case that they're discussing in New York is not about 2016 when Trump was doing the same things to Hillary Clinton. Uh, this catch and catch and kill technique, where they um, there's two parts of it. You know, go find the bad stories about Trump, buy them from the person, you know, get an exclusive, and then don't use it. But the other part was they were using checkbooks to get other people to tell stories that weren't true about Biden and Ted Cruz and uh, uh, Marco Rubio. I mean, this is, again, no accountability, no punishment for lies. I mean, anybody who walked through grocery store checkout lines in 2016, every week you saw another story about um, what a terrible guy Bill Clinton was and how Hillary was descended from aliens. I mean, it was it was astonishing how this magazine claimed to be journalism when it was actually just making up stories or hiring people to make up stories and getting away with it. And, and there was there's no accountability. But I, I so I'm kind of despairing if we have no reality 
or as I think you said that we have all uh, Klaus that we have alternate realities at the same time. I I I kind of I, I almost despair. And then in my professional work, I saw a little bit of that. I'm I'm part of a a UN uh, study group on AI under the auspices of the Internet Governance Forum. And I, I was part of this discussion with people who really don't understand the technology or understand how technology develops. And they were just repeating all these memes that they'd heard about AI. And, and again, they're, they're probably going to write a little report that will have the United Nations imprimatur, and it will spread some more misunderstanding about what AI is, what it can do, what it can't do. Uh, so I'm, I'm at a think tank. We're supposed to be working to find the truth. And I'm spending most of my time trying to correct other people who are spreading things that aren't true. And I'm spending a lot of time trying to get people to pay attention to the truth. Policymakers who have 17 different priorities and the truth seems to be lower and lower down on the path. So again, I'm, I, I, I go up and down. Uh, I, I, I did have one high point yesterday, had lunch with about uh, 20 people and the Philippine ambassador to the U.S. And I came away very impressed with uh, their their commitment to justice uh, in contrast to the previous administration under Duarte. I don't know that they're fighting corruption well enough in, internally, but they are very committed to justice uh, and, and pushing back against the Chinese who seem to have forgotten what justice was. So, truth. Well, I have a check-in that's <clears throat> probably will sound kind of shallow after those. So this is a good place for that to go, I guess. I've recently been, you know, uh, sent out to wander by my business, which has happened before when they turned into a productization. And we've worked out a thing where I'm still going to write for it and I'll find enough things, you know, as I start to wander, I, I can write things that are close enough to the reservation that would build the conference that's coming in Chicago and here in Nashville, but I can start wandering and stuff. And so I don't have a, every time I wandered before, and I've done this back to the eighties, somehow a startup would arise and it would work and we would sell it and it was fun and we went on and I'm not going to do that anymore. So I don't want to carry anything and I don't want to build anything or drive anything. Uh, so I'm looking for things to do. And, and it's a weird kind of, I've never been in this, in this space where I could wander. So I'm going to start uh, with a, you know, a, a position of public eccentricity is what I'm calling it. And there's a local anarchist bookstore and the, 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 the books our owner was one of the founders of let's the time currency and i'm gonna go and I'm, I, and there's two ideas i want to spread one is this giving to invest and the other is this mutual aid currency from africa and i think they could work well together so i'm going to go and talk to the africans at 10 o'clock every tuesday uh, on a table i'll probably rent it from them and get a little little tent that says we talked about currency here and we talked about currency and, and philanthropic investing. And maybe I'll get people who want to zoom in with me because the Africans are doing some really cool stuff and we're going to start to do some cool stuff here. Uh, and we want to link those two things and we think those things work well together. And so anyway, because uh, you have to establish some habits or you just wander around and shit. So I'm establishing, you know, a habit will be, I'll be there at 10 o'clock every uh, Tuesday talking to the Africans and I'll, I'll have a table and you can join me and we can talk to the Africans if you want to be in, be there. So, you, you know, you have to, for me, I have to create some kind of position of, of, of public eccentricity to, to, to cause something to, to happen. I, I don't know why, but that's, you know, I'm going to put on a little show over in the corner of the anarchist bookstore <laughs> you know, opening deep out of town, but I think we, we could have something. So anyway, since I don't know what to do, I'm going to put it on a tiny show. So that's, you know, but it's weird to not be, do what I've always been doing for the last 45 or, or 50 years. You know, well, I'm not going to come back with anything. I'm just going to go explore. And so 
you know, and produce for the business so that, you know, I'm, I'm helpful, but, but basically I don't know what, so I, I know one thing, you know, I'm going to be there uh, Tuesday at 10 uh, exploring that. And then who knows what the hell, um, uh, you know, is, I'm not going to commit for more than 90 days to anything. And I'm, I'm sort of interviewing um, startups to see if I, and there's a guy I want to help, I think, who's doing something and I would love to find a place with this startup. Another, uh, what well, this is really worth saying, I, this, this, somebody reached out and it's a fair trade of online marketplace and they are growing and they're trying to raise some capital around it. And so I started t- asking them questions and, and they didn't know their yield management and, and they didn't know their, their, uh, their segmentation of their customers and their, and their, their margins and they don't know who their people are and they don't know where they're from. And, you know, they don't, they don't know their people and they don't, they don't know what makes money. And so I asked them those things is, yeah, we're doing really well. We want to raise some capital. It's like, can you introduce us? And he said, you know, no, <laughs> you know, you're dumb and you don't know how dumb you are. And so, and she said, so you're not going to introduce us to money. It's like, no, I, I'm. You know, you're lucky that you're fumbling along and doing well, but you you are destined to fail with your approach. I mean, uh, you know, uh, I, I wouldn't bet on you, and I wouldn't refer you, and and I think you're you're, you're lucky that you're in business. Um, but I want nothing to do with you. But I found this other guy that's doing something interesting. So you know, I'm going to wander around and help a little bit, and, and uh, I don't. I, I'm trying to find, figure out what the heck I do when I don't do what I've always done. So that's it. I guess I'll hop in at this point because I've been sitting here pondering and I have a a reaction to the word trauma that automatically flips me toward resilience, which is sort of an interesting, so I've been sitting here trying to figure out how that came about. (laughs) And I think I was fortunate to have a family structure that was very open in dialogue and pretty much always asking questions rather than making statements that trained me to be inquisitive without mine even knowing I was being trained to be inquisitive. (laughs) Um, But when when I experienced personal trauma and I had an injury recently that caused that to occur, I flipped instantly into how do I respond to this? Not what is it or how do I wallow in it or how do I get more sympathy? But it's sort of a, how do you try to fix a situation whatever it is that you're encountering. And I think that many individuals are not aware that they're experiencing trauma. It almost requires that someone outside their circle say that sounds like it's kind of tough or some sympathetic statement that might elicit from them a little bit more of the emotional content of what has been occurring. And at the same time, I hold myself back unconsciously and slightly consciously from broader trauma because I can't do anything about the broad trauma. I can only deal with the people I interact with. And I could try writing papers or other things, but that doesn't feel like an effective way to deal with an emotional issue. And so I've been sitting here reflecting on, well, what are the dimensions of resilience? And that might be a different call. I'd be really interested in what other people do to maintain resilience when confronting various personal situations or collective situations. But it's it's this pairing of the yin and the yang, so to speak, of everything that's around us. And the collective trauma, you can sense it in things like driving behavior, people's social behavior at supermarkets, their impatience in general, and you can tell they're under stress, but 
but you can't even say something really general like it sounds like you're having a bad day because that might be perceived as critical. And so it's it's I'm I'm pondering not terribly successfully <clears throat> if there is a way to constructively intervene or if the best thing to do to intervene is to try to consciously focus on my own resilience so that I don't get pulled into a polarized position that's counterproductive. This is kind of a squishy conversation that I'm having here, but um, I'm sort of grappling with in the various organizations that I'm in where I'm seeing stress reaction in other people. I tend to, at this point in life, I just enter with, is there anything I could do to help <laughs> and see what they come back at me with and respond to that? Because if there's something they think they need, I can do and I'm comfortable with, then I just do it and maybe that will help. <laughs> and if it isn't something, often they just, they say, no, I, I don't think there's anything anybody can do to help. I mean, they're, they're in that sunken bubble of helplessness that I find it challenging to be appropriately supportive and helpful. And then I walk away and reflect on, well, what could I have done differently or something like that? So I'm not gonna say a whole lot more because it's more question than answer. <laughs> um, but I think it's good that we're talking about trauma, but it might be good to actually talk about resilience and what people have found or learned has been helpful personally or collectively in situations. I have a, a different, I don't have much of a check-in today. I have a question uh, left over from Jerry, I think from yesterday, <clears throat> which is um, how are generative AI and transformers re revolutionary uh, compared to machine learning and big data? And how much does it matter? And I think it's an interesting question and deeper than you'd think. That's it for today. Thanks. So um, yesterday at noon, I attended a webinar presentation. It was just a, a Zoom thing uh, hosted by the Wharton Club of Portland, with whom I do nothing. I've just never done anything, but I'm on their mailing list. The guest was Ethan Mollick, uh, who is a Wharton professor, who is on fire about Gen AI. And I, it just seems to me that checking in about that, because that was what I was going to check in about is perfect right after what Pete just said, because um, Malik was on fire in the best of ways. I don't mean evangelical fire. I mean, like, here's what I'm doing with my students. I used to ask them to uh, come up with a business. He teaches innovation, entrepreneurship, all that kind of stuff at Wharton. And he says, I used to, t I used to uh, ask them to come up with a business idea for some big business. Now I ask them to destroy a business. Um, uh, another one of my assignments is to do something impossible, <clears throat> by which he means, I don't know how to code. I, I, I couldn't do it. And, and so like a, a team of students who none of whom know how to code come up with a 3D printed prototype of a product they just invented uh, in, in, in like a couple sessions with ChatGPT or some other LLM. Um, and it wrote the code. It, it like, like everything that you thought was impossible or out of reach might, might be reachable. And the boundaries in my head um, were like really shifted in an hour of listening just to, just to, to Malik uh, run rampant on what's possible and what he's doing and how it's going and, and, and so forth. And it made me realize that 
he has turbocharged himself and is trying to do that for his students in a way that I have nowhere near done or approximated for myself in front of exactly the same suite of tools. There's nothing, I don't think there's anything he's using or doing. He probably has better access to some cool shit because people know who Ethan Mollick is and they're inviting him in to try stuff. And he mentioned a few things that I might not have had access to, but he's not doing anything I couldn't have maybe puzzled my way to. Uh, and if I'm going to try to advise people on our cyborg future, I better get the hell on this horse um, and figure more of this out because it was interesting. I'm uh, From the conversation that Pete and I were involved in yesterday, it was like, how do you convince corporations to not be ginger and to just jump in? Because this is this this there's a lot of payoff here. We can smell it, but we can't. We're having trouble articulating it. And in comparison to previous technology enthusiasms, like the metaverse, like blockchain and Bitcoin, like you know, four G, five G, ten G. There's now ads for ten G cellular, uh, or the Internet of Things, or th there's all sorts of enthusiasms. Some of which contain a few useful things, but all of which were oh my God, this is going to change everything. Uh, major money was poured into them in lots of different ways. And you're like, nah, really? A lot of that was not worth not worth the, the time wasted on those things. And I think Pete and I share, and maybe many of us in this room share, this notion that generative AI is different from those, that, it, that it's the standout shiny, shiny gem <clears throat> among these and is in fact a sea change in how things work. Um, and another funny part about Malik was that he a couple times jokingly ironically he would say you know keep sending your children to to business school but most of what he's teaching can now be done relatively quickly and almost better by one of these engines one of these smart external intelligences uh, he was uh, one of the key people in the uh, recent study done by BCG, where they took a whole bunch of BCG consultants, uh, uh, did a controlled study of using uh, this technology, uh, coined the term cyborgs and centaurs. Uh, centaurs are people who kind of partition their work with the gen with the AI. So uh, I will. I love to write, so I'm not going to ask AI to write my thing, but I'm going to ask the the AI to brainstorm ideas to make an outline and to turn it into a blog post, whatever, whatever. And then centaurs are more integrated where the, the AI becomes fused more with the things they do all the time. That's just a, an interesting distinction that he's putting up. But um, he's writing what he calls the jagged frontier um, because there's some things these things do well and some things they sort of drop out on. And if you don't get familiar enough to figure out what they're good at and what they're not good at and how to talk to them and how to get more out of them, you won't see the benefit. So for him, one of his big questions is, have you put in 10 hours using something like ChatGPT 4.0, right? Not 3.5, but have, you know, 4.0 and 10 hours. And at the 10 hour mark, you might start feeling some of what he's feeling, but it's, it's, and I didn't get a, an easy answer for, but it's easy to figure out to see that coming. I, I felt differently enthused about this technology that matters a lot right now at the end of one hour uh, with Moloch, which was quite impressive to me. And he is a scruffy guy. He was like, his hair was must. He was in his office. He was scratching his head half the time. He's very informal. He just like threw up, you know, his presentation and started going. And then you were like, Ooh, okay. Uh, so that's spun my head around a bunch and uh, is a piece of the check-in. And uh, I'll just add a, maybe a, an open question like Pete did as, as a, a latter thing, which is I'm just really interested in it and a little bit concerned about our sense-making or our global brainness, our, our global mindness in open global mind. I, I want us, I want somehow, I feel like, I feel like I need, I, I'm going to phrase this in entirely the wrong way. I feel like I need to push more or lead more on the global mindy part of what we do together. So that at the end of a couple of calls, four calls on governance, uh, two calls on trauma, other sorts of things, we have more shared goodness to put into the world together in some way. And I don't mean writing a, a book together necessarily, but there's a Neo Books project for that, which would be interesting. I mean, something different about the sense making part of why we why we hang out, which is always sort of hanging in the rafters. Uh, but I'm I'm very curious about that and want to do more about it. With that, I am complete for now.
You're muted. Muted. Gil. <laughs> That's why Mike's doing that. I, I <laughs> couldn't quite decipher the sign language. But like, is my mic not loud enough? Good morning, everybody. Um, uh, I wanted to follow Jerry, so I want to talk about the AI thing a bit. Um, um, oh. Let's see, where to go here? We'll skip that. So um, quick check-in um, on a couple of things. Um, I've been... Um, I've been focusing a lot on my coaching business um, and uh, just calling it that it's a new thing for me because it's been a coaching practice or a coaching side activity. Uh, and I've come to the conclusion that uh, running it like a business is going to be really different than running it like an activity. So I'm now in, in full crank mode um, with key activities and metrics that I'm tracking and the plan is to build that out to a sufficient platform that I can be stable and then do my more adventuresome grand schemes rather than constantly worrying about how to fund the grand schemes. So that's a watch this space. Um, this is the focus here is executive coaching for world changers. Uh, could be executives, founders, investors, um, uh, creators. Uh, if you know people who might benefit from deep, uh, tough love, uh, kick-ass ontological coaching uh, for success and impact and sanity and joy. I'm open to referrals and I will uh, cut a generous check to the NGO of your choice in return for any of that. Uh, related to that, that's where I want to focus here is that, and I, I think I've talked with you all before about we've been, we've been, I, I, I've probably 50 hours into AI at this point, maybe more. Jerry, I completely endorse what you're saying. I'd love to get in touch with Malik and talk with you more. Um, 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 I think it's a fair guess that this does change everything. It's different than the bubbles you've talked about before. I mean, Internet of Things was was a fancy buzz, and it's not now. It's now not a fancy buzz, but it's happening. Uh, blockchain, which I very much distinguish from Bitcoin. And and you know and the whole coin universe is quietly happening. It's just you know it's just rippling. Uh, AI is a very different thing. Um, um, diving in on the experience with it is really key. Uh, I've been building a bot of me as my main project. Been doing a couple of other things, but that's where the main focus has been on the theory that the coaching work that I do is one on one, high priced by design and by nature. Uh, but I've got a lot from 50 years of working in the sustainability field that's useful to a lot of people. So I'm looking at how do I make that broadly accessible uh, to a lot of people at a very low price point? And that's sort of the hypothesis. Like, can, you know, can we do that in a way that's useful and not stupid? That's the, that's the question that we're working on and um, may or may not go anywhere, uh, but it's given me a very focused, not just dabbling sandbox, but a real live dig in and build something sandbox, which has been a fascinating experience learning about how the AIs work, learning about how I work, uh, you know, figuring out what it is that I do when I work with people and what of that needs to be, um, uh, what of that can emerge from a generative a AI process and what of it needs to be directed. My, my lead programmer is out of the old school of if then else loops. You know, if somebody says, A, Gil says 21, I don't want to do it that way. I want to do something that here's a field of all my content and let's see what emerges. And damn, it's pretty good. It's not perfect. It's not consistent. Um, it's very dependent so far. And this is, I think, generally true about the IS. Generally, it's very dependent on the kind of prompts that people put into it. And for me, it's analogous to the early days of desktop publishing when all of a sudden everybody could design stuff. And guess what? Most of it was crap. Uh, most of it was ugly. You know, we put 17 fonts on a page. We had to learn how to do it. We had to learn how to be smart about it. We still went to designers for certain things. And so it feels very parallel to that, a lot of slop. Um, but um, um, as we're finding it, we're now out to like a half a dozen alpha testers, seeing what it's like for regular people to use this. And we're tweaking and tweaking and tweaking. So it's a fascinating process. Uh, I'm happy to have any of you uh, take a look at it and kick the tires if you're interested. 
But the other piece about that is I went last night to one of Peter Layden's events in San Francisco. Some of you know Peter. Uh, he's a, a serious tech optimist. And he's doing um, uh, a series of events around AI and, and last night was AI and energy and climate. Uh, next one in, I don't know if it's in May or June, is going to be about health and biology. Um, this one had people ranging from uh, you know, Google X and tech startups, and McCower from Green Biz and John Picard, the designer. And the mood was extreme techno optimism. Um, you know, people are wondering about the enormous energy demand of AI. And so there are folks talking about uh, uh, dramatically reducing the energy and carbon footprint of data centers. That's one direction. Other direction, using AI to, to redesign, reinvent data centers and the electric grid for orders of magnitude improvements in effectiveness and efficiency. So that, that was kind of the, the high frame of the story. Um, uh, the mood was electric. Uh, kind of, you know, pretty exciting, actually. And it was interesting to me because I've had deep concern about the carbon footprint impacts, figuring that at some point this could get better, but it's going to be a while. And here was folks saying, no, no, we're on this right now. Um, um, the other interesting part of that story is that I, I did a couple of very quick LinkedIn posts last night. I just didn't have, wasn't able to do much content. This is the first actually live networking event I've been to in four years. So I was in a room of 200 people with a mask on, um, and it was weird and fascinating and really good to be with humans. Um, um, so I just did a little, you know, I, I, did, I did some screenshots and some posting on the fly, and the reactions on LinkedIn, which I haven't responded to yet this morning, were really interesting, basically along the lines of, oh, this is bullshit. This is looking for a silver bullet to a complex problem. Don't you understand how complex things are? The energy demand is impossible. And of course, I hadn't given them any content, so there's that. Uh, but it was interesting to see how knee-jerk the response from my sustainability buddies was to this possibly enormously significant opportunity that also has, you know, lots of dangers in it, um, um, both technologically and also what it will do in the hands of who it's in the hands of, uh, and also um, what happens this is like my, my latest big concern. What happens when this thing becomes deeply self-referential? More AI content being put out in the world, which AIs are then being trained on. And that sort of weird recursive loop may be raced to the bottom. Uh, so um, you can tell I have some enthusiasm running this morning. Um, I'm very eager to move my product along to the point where we can decide, is this worth putting out in the world or not? Uh, I'm completely comfortable with killing it if that's what if that what needs to be done because I'm learning so much along the way, and um, there's way more going on than meets the eye. I guess I'll leave it at that. I'm complete, and I'm going to go off camera. I'm still here, but I'm just rustling up some breakfast. I'd love to be a beta tester if I could just say that. That's pretty. That's an interesting thing. I, I know something about. Yeah, it's Alpha, Kevin, but I'd be happy to bring you in. Yeah, I'm, I'm just doing random shit now. So, you know, I, I have time to do that. So, yeah. Um, well, so um, let me enrich the offer for you. I'll, let, let's do, let's have you Alpha test, give me feedback, then I'm happy to talk with you about stuff you're interested in and share what I'm learning with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. Okay. I, I Sure. What a good idea. Thanks. Cool. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Carranza, there's no rush. And I don't know if your comments at the top of the call were meant as your check-in. They were slightly in that way, but you are welcome to check in again. And there is no rush. And once you've checked in, I think we switch ourselves into wild and crazy chat conversation bubble mode. Mm -hmm. 
There's a difference between healing and sustaining between kind of surviving. Um, I'm rather tired personally of being in surviving and not in thriving and um, one of the things that um, struck me as I was reading um, the previous two check-ins before this one was somebody had said something like, mm, in COVID, now everybody has Trump. Mm. the human side of technology um the the place where emotions are the place where we desire something we work towards that we influence or or ask or set up systems of reward hopefully um to basically say ah I want this let's do it and now do it together with um um i wouldn't say another another agent let's say which uh um is many like Cambrian explosion AIs. So you got the spiky AIs, you got the really wiggly little AIs, you got the global circular AIs that only move in 90 degrees. You've got a huge difference of mm, emotional, emotionally resonant. Um, interactions that have a strangeness culturally. We don't have AIs sharing their experiences in a way that, that we can understand. For example, they certainly are able to talk about trauma um with the um mm, careful legal note at the bottom yeah this is produced by an ai and its accuracy and reliability should be checked before use now Who's checking the checkers? Really, um, I'm thinking about an experience at uh, one of the um, Internet Archive Friday lunches. And again, if anybody's in San Francisco on a Friday, um, please uh, come on and uh, uh, we'll try to make room for you, but we appreciate that you email to info at archive.org. Wednesday before the Friday to say, hey, can we show up? Um, so there'll be enough food. These, we get lots of young AI people um, coming to these Friday lunches. And after, you know, introductions go all around. Um, I walked up to these two young men who are, you know, wildly successful in their, their AI. And I go, well, what do you do when the AI cheerfully and authoritatively gives you the wrong information? 
They go, yeah, we got real problems with that. And okay, <laughs> thanks for that. But uh, um, okay, um, so personally, um, emotions haven't been great. They haven't been. Um, I told somebody who asked me if uh, I was going to feel good now, and I'm just trying not to feel bad. Um, you know, um, I have that kind of resilience because I have felt good. I have been in love. I have, you know, really enjoyed my childhood, even though, you know, some things were... Um, mm, different um because my parents definitely had trauma and their parents definitely had trauma and now mm, my brother has kids his kids definitely have trauma um one of my uh, well, yeah, I'll skip that. Anyway, um, it's nice being back. Not so sure that I'll be able to integrate into uh, um, OGM as I'd hoped to in the past. Um, I'm really uh, fascinated um, from what I read in the Mattermost. I'm glad to see Jack Park is still alive. Um, I should connect with him. Um, I took a look at um, Massive Wiki and what's been going there and took a look at a couple of the uh, um, associated repositories on GitHub. What do I do with my next 30 years? Um, Betsy Burroughs, uh, a person I uh, no longer have that much contact with. But when she turned 75, she was inspired to create a 25 year plan. And I thought, wow, you know, that's, that's gutsy. Um, and you know there's life transitions um i've yet again survived my body um but uh you know that won't that won't last um and so healing trauma And even more, having the insight, emotional stability, and freedom from a stereotype that refuses to acknowledge one's own pain because it hurts is incredibly important for the ability to connect with one another. Certainly um, there are prejudices, stereotypes, habits that you know I'm not going to basically take your time to tell you how hurt I am, what my trauma was, is, you know, and, you know, I'm fine. But I have experience where I've not been fine. And, um, you know, like a post-cancer PTSD, I think uh, most of you saw when I was, well, kind of not me. Um, or... I was a me that wasn't being 
hmm, inhibited um, by the neural inhibitors or social inhibitors that would have me mm, display as I mostly have throughout my life. Um, certainly um, going through something like cancer and chemo and not realizing that um, I wasn't resilient as I thought I was. Damn resilient. Um, but saying to people I don't know, people I do know, that um, you know, and, and yeah, relationships, uh, you know, certainly with you know, family and uh, situations where you know people were dying and there were multiple realities around that and you know one of the incredibly stressful times is it the community whichever community you know at work um uh the neighborhood that i live in um you know the people i know at restaurants um is it their right need to be able to you know somehow accept influence maybe themselves be changed by um these very uncomfortable and real and universal kinds of emotional situations where emotions can be mindless and unintentionally hurtful and you know certainly in hanging around younger people um going oh, you're you're too intense you're triggering me I, I can't deal with what you're saying it's like okay no i'll, I'll not do it um but um it strikes me it was kind of weird where i was in a uh, little conference and i showed a video of a ted talk by mary Catherine bateson who is one of my heroes and she was talking about second adulthood given that we last at least about 30 years past our 40s when a hundred years ago that might have been you know the length of a human lifespan we've got this extra time where we most of us are healthy for the most part um you know i've been through some medical stuff that's been annoying but uh um yeah i'm here i'm talking in about a week yeah be happier at work um right now but um these younger people watching mary Catherine bateson were triggered they said i've never been more mm, kind of feeling myself get angry because you now she's saying that um, the older people have the time which maybe younger people don't because they're raising families because they're working and they took that as okay boomer you know uh, yeah you're you're um we're pissed off that you think we can't do it that was their um impression which i didn't even think was possible from the same content that we watched together 10 minutes ted talk that um there were you know more than one 
were like, you know, these old people, man, you know, they created all these problems for us. And, well, what is the truth of that? Thank you for listening. Thanks, Mark. Um, I'll step in for a second before going to Stacey and Klaus because Ken, uh, you just joined us and I'd love to give you a moment to check in if you'd like because everybody else has checked in. We were about to switch modes, but I also just want to observe. I want to, um, I'm grateful that for the heart with which you have all shown up here today and, and Klaus, you in particular, you just had uh, a really deep meeting with your daughter and her family and so forth. And you shared it with us in a, just a really lovely moving way. I, I really appreciate that. But everybody's shown up with a lot of heart here today. And I'm grateful for that. Um, Mark, I love the considered way you put words <laughs> into a space. And I this is going to hopefully make everyone laugh. But I was reminded of when you type in a, a prompt GPT and it starts composing words kind of slowly. And they come out and I could almost see that happening as you were speaking. It was like, oh God, no, this is infecting my head. Anyway, um, so uh, Ken, if you'd like, and then to Stacy and Klaus. Hello, everybody. Sorry for being late. I had a client call. Um, I, I feel a little awkward coming in after Mark's deep share and not knowing what else is happening here. So I'll just say I'm well and happy to be here. Thanks, Ken. Uh, Stacey, I think you were in the queue yeah. first. I just wanted to share some very simple reflections to connect a few of the things about truth and some different things that people said, which is that, and again, I hate using the word trauma, but I think that most people, and I would, I'm would, i curious to know if anybody here has not had that feeling when you were young of being afraid to ask a question in class, of being afraid to be laughed at because the question's too silly or whatever. And I think those are one of the little traumas that we should pay attention to. Um, you know, there's an expression, we see things not as we are. We see not, we see things not as they are. We see things as we are, and we don't just see them that way. We experience them that way. We retell them that way. And I guess the only thing that, I, what I really want to try and say, because Jerry, you did ask like, what can we do? And in talking to people, especially, you know, we started off talking about the Middle East, I think that one of the things we have to do, and maybe Ken will back me up, is be really careful with our words. We have to stop appropriating words like apartheid and genocide. We have to be able to ask, well, what do you mean when you say you're a Zionist? Because I have asked many people this, and sometimes people are extremely defend, depending who I'm talking to, they're either extremely defensive, well, you should know, or they're, I mean, what I'm trying to say is we often use language before we have all agreed on what that label means. And if we could just make it a practice that if we're gonna use a vocabulary word, what does it mean to you and you and you and you? Then we could sort out those differences and make it part of a routine. That's my two cents. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Stacey. Feels important too, yeah. Um, Klaus, then Mike. Yeah, I wanted to uh, come back and pick up on the conversation about AI. Um, and and uh, I mean, I actually drafted a letter to my daughter uh, with the help of my AI, and it it came across really well. You know, um, uh, it went much deeper and and uh, um, more uh, far 
cautious and praising than I could have mustered myself. And but that's that that's not the point. I, I went to a tech meeting yesterday, climate tech here in Bend, and I had some great conversations with people who are working you know, in the uh, uh, in the uh, various aspects of the tech sector. You know, some students from OSU were there, uh, business people who are installing solar and so on and so on. And AI is really, really penetrating their consciousness, their awareness, but they just don't really know how to use it yet. Now, so there is, so I mean, I come back to comparing this to the introduction of the uh, Microsoft Office, you know, when Excel came out and, and uh, uh, PowerPoint and so on, and how radically it transformed the way we communicate and uh, how radically it transformed the accounting profession, for example, you know, starting with great angst and, and uh, fear for losing jobs to where now it's completely embedded into the into our toolkits. Um, so that that's really the same here. And and I think the most immediate, most powerful way of having AI assist is by really using it uh, as a as a personal counsel, so to speak. So Pete posted this interview with uh, this one guy who created an alter ego and had a conversation with them, right? Um, that actually sort of motivated me to have this conversation that I posted yesterday. Um, and, it, and it was astounding how advanced this conversation really is, right? How mature the AI responds back. And then I also instructed my AI to use a Socratic method of inquiry to interact with me, right? So it pops right back with uh, the next question. Um, so I think we can really help people by, um, by, by teaching how to, how to amplify themselves, right? How to turbocharge themselves. Uh, so my son, for example, you know, he's head of talent branding for Sam Sarah. Um, you know, he had a meeting with the CEO of the company last week and, and uh, engaged about you know, some, some issues. He goes to the AI before the meeting and runs through uh, uh, what if, uh, you know, where could this conversation lead? Here's what I know so far. And how do I position myself? What are the key issues that uh, the CEO... Uh, would be interested in how do I position myself, and it's amazing, right? How uh, how he then enters a conversation so well prepared and and uh, uh, leaving an impression there with with the uh, senior management. So it is it is going to change the way we operate and act you now. And if you learn how to use it you now in this way, where it is your own personal boost, you, know, you you are triple charging yourself, then I think this can really make a difference uh, in, in the professional world. Because they are, I mean, it's basically, there's logic, right? And so in my environment, I'm just in the raving discussion about biofuels. Well, they are, you know, they, they are, they are options that you can, that you can insert into the conversation that are very productive, very positive. Um, and, uh, and uh, they're based on logic, you know? And so the, the challenge now is really to convince companies, corporations who have all the resources, you know, not just money, but technology and talent and so on, to engage in this in this transformation that we need to have um, and, and, and provide, you know, an image of positivity and can do a, a kind of, uh, of sense so that we can move. Yeah. Um, and AI, I think, can help uh, frame the words. And, you know, just as Stacy was just saying, I mean, the reason why I use AI to uh, to communicate even with my daughter is to avoid trigger words, which invariably I would say something that just uh, goes, shoots off in the wrong direction, right? So I'm like super cautious and uh, and and uh, and it helps me, you know, to to frame things the way I want to frame them, so I don't inadvertently, you know, do something that uh, that turns off wrong. And I think that's the same in business. You know? um, if you go to your boss, there are certain triggers that you don't want to touch, and you may not know that you're that you're doing it. So this, uh, if if we take this this uh, 
tool and, and, and personalize it, you know, I think it can really it can really make a difference. And Klaus, that last observation is really, really, really interesting. And I, I, I thank you for sharing it that way with us because um, I'm wondering whether more of us will, will use these new AIs as appropriate filters in our communications and will it improve our communications? That's really cool. Thanks. Um, Mr. Nelson. Just real quick, uh, a, a short story and, and two tweets about truth. Uh, we talked a lot about trauma and truth. And um, at this lunch I was at with the Philippine ambassador, there was a person who asked a question about the timing of the recent summit. There's a trilateral summit between Biden, the prime minister of Japan, and the and the, and the president of, uh, uh, of the Philippines. And it happened that the summit started on the day of valor and this is a holiday in the philippines when they honor the the victims of the baton death march and because the japanese were in town they didn't have a ceremony here in washington and this woman was incredibly upset i mean it clearly some distant relative must have died or or suffered through the march and she was just like, don't you think this was scandalous? And, you know, they shouldn't have had it in that week at all. And it, it was her truth. And it was true. It was true that there was a, sort of a conflict. And uh, um, they did not celebrate the 82nd anniversary of the Bataan Death March. And that's that's a, a, something we forget when we say, is that true? Well, it's not whether it's just true. It's, is it true and traumatic? <laughs> You know, is it true and driving people to see the world differently? Um, and 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 this this then goes to my two tweets that builds on what Stacy said about how words really matter, and whether you're anti-Semitic or anti-Israel. Um, in my mind, there's there's true, and there's real, and the the, the Bible is not real in my understanding. I'm not a fundamentalist, but boy, is a lot of it true. Aesop's fables are not real, but there's a lot of truth there. And I will teach my grandchildren Aesop's fables. But we have to, we have to understand the connotations and the, the emotional power that comes with words. One of the most influential books I read when I was in high school was by S.I. Hayakawa, and some of you may have read his books as well. Um, there's also these famous books on um, metaphors, and I'm trying to remember the author's name. It's a, don't George see the Lincoln elephant metaphors. We metaphors live we live by. Right, and, and there's also the one about elephants. I can't. But anyway, those two taught me a lot about how, as Klaus just said, pay attention to how other people attach emotion to words. And I'll finish with a professional example. I was on this call about AI and people were confusing risk, damage, and um, harm. And it was really sort of a, a problem of tense. You know, damage is something that's already happened. Risk is something that could happen today. And harm I mean, uh, the harm is something that could happen today, and risk is sort of what we project to happen. They were using the terms interchangeable because they wanted to express their fear. And there was no way to quantify any of it. They just had a fear, and that was driving the discussion and driving some of their suggestions. So those are my tweets. Maybe I should tweet those. Thanks for a great discussion, and and Klaus and and Jerry, thanks for and Malik, thanks for inspiring me to go spend uh, at least ten hours on each of the different AI platforms. Thanks, Mike. Uh, the difference between risk, harm. What was the list again? I mean, if you have a damage tweet, is post... past, harm is something that we could see today, and risk is something that could develop. And I mean, it's, it's, it, they're overlapping, obviously, in, in time and, and severity, but it, it is odd to see how even good lawyers who are supposed to know the difference between these words will use them in ways that completely confuse the conversation. Thank you.
great distinctions. Mr. Friend. Briefly, because I know we're late, Stacy. yes, very much thank you for what you said. Um, uh, we assume that words mean the same thing to everybody and they don't. And it's a wonderful invitation for curiosity and an invitation into a more exploratory conversations. So that's really cool. Um, um, Mark, about the AI disclaimer of the accuracy and reliability should be checked before use as a footnote. You could kind of put that on anything, including stuff by real live human beings, right? We forget that. Um, one of the most interesting uses of AIs that I've seen is having asking it the same query and asking it to respond in different voices of different people. You know, what would Aristotle say about this? What would Adam Smith say about this? What would Karl Marx say about this? What would Mary Oliver say about this? And it's a fascinating provocation to open the dimensionality of my own thinking. Really just very enriching and surprising to me. Um, Mike, um, is it true? Is it traumatic? Is it that for them? Because different people will have different responses to the same so-called true events. And I always go back here to um, John Searle's work on speech act theory, uh, which draws a really important distinction between assessments, which are opinions, interpretations, which is what we do all the time, um, and uh, which are neither true nor false, right? Uh, I, I feel cold in this room. It's just like, I, that's what I feel. You may not feel that way. Uh, and an assertion, which is something that can be grounded and tested and verified. Uh, it's 78 degrees in this room. It's true or not true. We can verify it. And humans get those really muddled and we fight a lot about our, about our assessments. We debate our assessments, but you can't resolve a debate about an assessment. It's not true or not true. And we pour a lot of juice onto that, juice, J-U-I-C-E, sorry, um, um, uh, that could be better directed into, you know, like Stacy said, that's interesting. Um, why do you, tell me more about why you feel that way. I, I don't have that same experience. What you said is in, you know, fascinating to me. Tell me more, as opposed to, you fool, how could you possibly say that? Because it's an opinion, and we do that, and we, and we can't not do that. That's what humans do. Done. Thank you. Thanks, Gil. Um, we are well over time. Uh, Ken, I don't know if you have a poem for us. You do good. So, uh, Mr. Carranza, if you would step in briefly. Uh, you're muted, but if you could be brief. Yeah, uh, briefly. Um, uh, I agree with what Gil says. And uh, yeah. Um, uh, handle with care, both humans and large language models and generative AIs and yeah um hair really leads to some healing and helps with uh um, resiliency thanks thanks mark so uh, I will say a little something uh, based on these last couple of comments um Anyone who read my uh, story in the Plex about uh, Breath of Fire and warming the woman up who had uh, hypothermia, um, Patty Cobain wrote me and said, I teared up reading that. And I said, would you mind telling me why you're teared up? And she said, yeah, because um, I'm a woman and I've been alone in the wilderness. And if a man discovered me injured, I'd be incredibly afraid. And the way that you gave this woman care and took care of her made me very, I was deeply touched. And I said, thank you, you know, I forget. I just do what I do. I forget that a woman alone in the wilderness would feel very vulnerable. And, you know, I, I just, it's not in my consciousness. And that's an example of how words, you know, I'm pouring out this story and I see it one way and someone reads it and they're like, wow, they're really moved deeply. Why, what? And then like, wow, okay, thank you. It reminds me other people have very different perspectives than my own. So this is called open-mindedness. <clears throat> we tend to think that being open-minded is about being open to the possibility that something we disbelieve is true. That is only half the picture. Being open-minded also means being open to the possibility that something we believe is false. The truth is that we tend to believe what we want to believe. And as long as we merely want to believe something to be the truth, we will never know the truth. 
you can choose to believe that the lover who left you to have left because you were too good for her. But it's just a belief. The truth might be that you were not good enough for her. And because it might hurt you to ask, and that she might hurt you in telling you the truth, you will never know the truth. Yet it is an assumption that you will be hurt. An assumption that the truth will not set you free when your false belief keeps you a prisoner from reality. When we speak of seeking spiritual truth, it is not about a vague, unseen, mystical concept that explains everything. It's about discovering aspects of reality in everyday life, such that one lives in greater and greater light of clarity, such that one becomes more and more down to earth in a non-mystical way. The day we are so down to earth that we are rooted in the here and now is the day we awaken to all truths that already lie naked before us, which is another name for truth by Nguyen Tuan An. How in the hell did you do that? That was like the perfect poem for what we just discussed in the last half hour. It's what he does. I, it's just, He's got an I AI. Do, He's got a poetry <laughs> AI. <laughs> no, guys. This it's is an attuned what, intelligence, not an artificial intelligence. Humans, humans used to know how to do this. That was before anything was written do. down. They just remembered it out of their brain, right? A lot of people could recite poems long poems mm -hmm. it was a skill in greek some of them were named homer <laughs> <laughs> simpson <laughs> you can studying. recite poems don't <laughs> this is one Damn. of the things that blew me away studying with gregory bateson back in the long ago as he'd be you know he'd be lecturing and talking and conversing about stuff and then he would just all of a sudden go into declaiming from long passages of poetry from memory because you know classic british education from the long ago is just really rich Free television. They put, on, they, they put you under the ice cold shower and make you memorize a poem. That's how you raise kids. There it is. Ken, can you give us the link to that one? Uh, I can't give you the link, but I can. Uh, it's it's in a um, it to me? document that I have, so I, I can I can post it. Perfect. Thank send you. it out to the list. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Call. Good to see y'all. Pete, see thanks so much for um for uh Reed Hoffman and his. Oh, his read AI. I love that. It just was so thought provoking to me to see him having this conversation. And, um, you know, it's, it's, I, I really appreciate you, you post. I, I appreciate everything you post, but that one in particular. Thank you. Yep. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye -bye. Adios.